Second Chronicles chapter 9 And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem. Right? Solomon, a type of Jesus Christ. Queen of Sheba, type of someone who doesn't know. A Gentile woman comes to a Jew for answers. And Peter tells the Christian that we are to, well, Paul says, to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And Peter backs that up by saying, we better be, be able to give answer to them that have questions. So what you see is a type of, uh, of what we are to know. Because the Bible says we're to be Christ-like. And if we can't do it, the Bible won't tell you to do it. And there's, there's things I've been heard before that no one will come to you. You have to go to them. It's not the truth. I've had people come to me and ask me about what I have, my religion, or I've had people ask me about Jesus. I've had people come up and ask me for a gospel track. You may be lucky in your time of life that somebody will come to you for answers. And you didn't have to go to them. I hope your life has lived so much that somebody will recognize something different about you. And the problem is, uh, when you get Christians today, you got to live above Christians. you got to have a higher standard to have somebody come to you. You can't be like the world. You do what the world does and you're a Christian, you're not going to have anybody come and ask you questions. Because you ain't got the answers. So she comes to Jerusalem. She comes to Solomon. With a very great company. So not only does she come to here, but she brings her, her people. She brings her servants. She brings her maybe her family. She's got a lot of people with her from, uh, from Sheba. And camels that bear spices. That's for food cooking. Spices were very important and very expensive back then. They didn't have Walmart. You couldn't go down to the grocery store and buy cinnamon or, or any oriental spices. You had to go to China. You had to go down to Africa. You had to go to the country. They were used for medicines. They were used for... Uh, cooking and they were also a lot of spices were used as money great trading and gold in abundance and precious stones like Solomon really needed this he really needed precious stones he really needed gold he had it all over the place and when she was come to Solomon she communed with him of all that was in her heart she hid nothing she Asked all the questions. She made all the statements. She sat Solomon down and she saw. She wanted to know. There are people out there who really want to know. They're really searching. And God will give them the answer. God will direct them. Notice she does not come to an angel. An angel does not come to her. Like Acts chapter 10. When the angel came to Cornelius, he says, go get Peter. Man is the one that carries the, the good news, the good tidings. And Solomon told her all her questions. He said, what do you guys say about that? 2 Timothy 2.15, 1 Peter 3.15. You, you better be ready to give an answer and you better study. Uh, Paul also tells Timothy, and I believe Titus, avoid foolish questions. There are some questions out there that are just stupid. They don't need an answer. Where did Cain get his wife? How many animals were on the ark? Those are time-wasting questions. And I, think, I don't think the Queen of Sheba brought stupid questions. I think she was really searching. I think she really wanted to know something. That's why she's recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 9. 9, the fruits of the Spirit. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, 
Zoro requested, and there was nothing hid from Solomon, which he told her not. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, how do you see wisdom? You know, when you think about wisdom today in schools and all that, you know, you heard some Greek uh, uh, idiot, you heard some psychologist, some uh, philosopher, you've heard this great guy with PhDs, and it says she saw the wisdom of Solomon. Not only did he, not only did he talk, but he walked what he talked. He wasn't a hypocrite. His life led what he spoke. If you don't talk and walk the talk, you are a hypocrite. You can say all oh, you want, I'm a Christian, but if you don't live what Jesus Christ told us to be, if you don't do what a Christian is supposed to do, you are a hypocrite. And when people come and look at you, they know you are a hypocrite. You're not fooling nobody. Because people out there who are lost knows anybody who claims to be Christ is supposed to live a marvelous, wonderful life. They know you're supposed to be living above what they're living. In the house that he had built. Notice she sees what Solomon's doing before she sees the house. You can build 3,000 million churches, 3,000 million temples. If you're not walking Christ-like, it's nothing. You can hand out 3 million thousand quadrillion tracts, and if you don't walk Christ-like, it don't mean nothing. You can give $200 billion to a missionary, and if your walk don't walk, don't talk, Read James. He talks about your faith and being dead if you don't have works. Now, we're not saved by works. But how do you prove your love to the Lord? Skipping out on church when the doors are open? Not reading your Bible? Not praying? The meat of his table. That's the dinners he's had. The food. And the sitting of his servants, orderly. There's an orderly fashion. And the attendance of his ministers, the ones that helped him out in, in his office as king, how they came in, how the proper time they came in, and what they did, and how they did it. You know what? If your family ain't right, the world will see it. If you're a Christian businessman and things ain't right at the job site, they will see it. If your church ain't right, the world will see it. There's nothing in. And if you think you fooled the world, Jesus, I mean, God says that, uh, Behold the eyes of the Lord in every place, beholding the evil and the good. You are being watched. And their apparel, they dress properly. Man, you didn't think you had to raise that one in a, in a Baptist church today. They dress properly. And his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord. Now remember it said that the temple was built high. It wasn't just stairs. It was stairs. It was a miraculous, wonderful climb up to that up to that temple. Beautiful. Remember, he covered everything with gold. Like I say, he imagined the noontime sun in, in this desert kind of region, this bright sun, and just to fasten him and just blind your eyeballs. And that's what heaven's going to be one day. When you realize that God is light and his light outside the sun and the moon. It shines everything on New Jerusalem. What a wonderful that's the thing is going to be. There was no more spirit in her. Think about the day when we see Jesus Christ. When we see those cherubim. When we see those 24 elders. When we see the angels. When we see his throne. When we see the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You want to talk about turning to goo? As I've had guys come up to me, I'll walk with Jesus, my man Jesus, and you're a man, you're a fool. I guarantee you'll be showing up to Jesus Christ on your knees with your nose in the dirt, if there's any dirt. And you ain't going to look up until he invites you to look up. Be humble before you stumble. And she said to the king, it was a true report, which I have heard with my own which I have heard in my own land of thy acts, of thy wisdom. You better make sure you do right as a Christian. And when somebody comes to your house, you don't have two personalities, one at church and one at the house. You don't have two personalities, one at work and one at the house. You are who you are even in your private life. This is what you're learning out of chapter 9. It's called character. Character is who you are when you're alone. It's not how you act like when you're in front of anybody. It's how God sees you and only God sees you. By the way, you want to mark chapter 9 verse 5 please? You want to mark that verse? Because that's the only verse that you see truly one God under one nation. That's the only place where you see one nation under God, indivisible, and for liberty, and for justice for all. Right there. That's the only place you see it. How be it? I believe not their words. You know what? She's a very honest woman. She's looking at Solomon and saying, you know what? I didn't believe it. Until I came. You know, some people are not going to believe Jesus Christ until they come to you. And you better have a testimony. And you better be living right. Because if they see what you, what, if they see a side of Christ that, that doesn't bear witness to what Christ is, they see a, a side of life in you that's not where you're supposed to be living, what do you think they're going to say? Do you think it's important to live Christ-like? Do you think it's important that, that Paul says, abstain from all appearance of evil? You better believe it. You better believe what you do will have an eternity with a soul. And you ain't just playing games. I'm a practical joker. I love a joke just as good as the next person. But when you deal with someone's eternal soul, there is no fooling around. There is no room for worldliness. It better be by the Bible and only the Bible. Because I know people who say they're saved, and I guarantee 99% because I can't know that 1%. I don't believe they're saved. I think they've been conned. Some preacher, some parent, someone told them they were saved. This verse, is, this chapter is very important. I mean, if you're not going to live right, you think you've got everybody fooled. And if you're a born-again Christian, I'm not talking to any lost person. If you're a born-again Christian, how would you like to stand before your church? How would you like to stand before your parents? How would you like to stand before everybody that you know who's saved and have Jesus Christ call you a flat-out liar? You know what I believe? The Bible says we're going to get a new name in heaven. How would you like to have a name, Jesus gives you a name, hypocrite, for all eternity? Useless. Liar. You think Jesus would do that? Don't you know the names in the Bible? They reflect what kind of person that was. Edom was called, Esau was called that because he was red. Abraham was, had his name changed because he was a father of many nations. I believe that with my heart. That your new name will be your character and how you live since you've been born again to the rapture or to your death. But see, the Christian walk is not taken seriously today. 
better take a wise word from the Queen of Sheba. My eyes have seen it. Can people look at you and see it? Or what do they see? And wait to the day when your eyes see Jesus in glory. That's why I don't believe. Uh, that's something else. I don't believe when you when people are in heaven today. I don't believe they can see us now. It's too wonderful in glory. Why would you want to look back this miserable planet? And that's personal. You can throw that in the garbage can. But just imagine one day when you finally get, you finally get to see Jesus. Your faith is gone. You're there with the angels and all that. I wouldn't want to look back this miserable planet. I've seen it. And behold, the one half of thy greatness of thy wisdom was not told to me. You know, 95% of what we've been, 95% we have not been told about in Jerusalem. You know, no one today can, I don't care what kind of talent you got. You cannot paint a picture of Jesus. You cannot. What's it going to be like that one day when we see Jesus? What's it going to be like in eternity when, when he holds his hands out and you see those nail print, those nail pierce uh, marks in his hand and realize that was done for you and he's the only one in heaven who's marked and scarred. What's the expression? Scarred for life? How about eternal life? How about hearing those cherubim? Holy, holy. I can't even imagine. Think of uh, Every time I read that revelation, I think, what are the voices like? What are they like? And if, if you don't, if you die before the rapture, can you just imagine wherever you are, you close your eyes and you start hearing, holy, holy, holy. What is that? Holy, 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 and you just hear, and it just gets louder and it gets louder. Listen, you you go into you go into the heaven. Your soul has eyes. The rich man in hell had eyes. He had a tongue, and you just open up your eye about eye about, and there you are. You're in glory, and there's all you've been reading about in the Bible. And you're walking around, and maybe you do get up there. Maybe you do get to run into grandma and grandpa. They're there, they're there, you know what I'm talking about. And imagine, here you are, you're, you're before the cherubim, you're before the angels, we're praising God, and all of a sudden, oh, what is that? That's Satan. Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, it was like, whoa, what's he doing up there? You ought to read your Bible, the Bible already tells you he's up there. And he's not going to leave heaven to Revelation 12. Wow, my eyes have seen it. <laughs> I don't want to look at that no more. See, a lot of people realize, I'm going to go to heaven. They don't realize when they go to heaven, they're going to see Lucifer, Satan. And they're going to see an intergalactical battle like no one battle before. Revelation 12. You can't even fathom. This, this, Queen of Sheba is telling you, you can't even fathom what heaven's like. This is a Gentile. Oh! You mean a Gentile that gets saved, born again, Christian, telling you about Jesus, telling you about heaven? Put away all the Easter eggs, I tell you, really, let's speak the truth. For thou exceedest the fame that I heard. Yeah, that's what heaven's going to be like. It's going to extreme of all the extremes that you ever heard about. Happy are thy men. Glory in heaven. And happy are these thy servants. We're all going to be happy, blessed. When one day Jesus is going to wipe away all sorrow and all tears. No more pain. No more suffering. It's not what hell is going to be like. Which stand continually before thee. Can you imagine a place where we're not going to sleep? Where we can stand and our legs are not going to get tired? And hear thy wisdom. Can you imagine listening to Jesus all eternity? Can you imagine somehow, I don't know how, 
Imagine just Jesus all calling us all up and say, all right, let's start in Matthew 1.1 1, 1, and we're going to just keep on going. By the way, you know what John says? John says you can't even contain all the books about the life of Jesus. You imagine Jesus telling us his entire life as in what we didn't even read yet. All that's not that's recorded. You know, one day we will know what day Jesus was born. And every preacher and every man that says it was Jesus, December 25th and celebrated Christmas, I hope Jesus smacks him in the face. It's bad enough saying, how dare you say I was resurrected on the Roman holiday. Hear thy wisdom. Just imagine. Jesus is all true. He never lies. And he knows it all. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighteth in thee to set thee on his throne. Imagine one day God's going to be pleased when he sets his son on the throne. That's what God's waiting for, you know. He's waiting for that day when his son gets off his right hand and he has his own throne. And he gives him all power. And the day when everybody comes up and worships his son. See, we're not just talking about, listen, I'm bringing this right to the church. I'm bringing this right in eternity. I'm not even talking about the Queen of Sheba with Saul. I'm talking about when we get to heaven. To be king for the Lord thy God. Imagine Jesus. Imagine David. Because thy God loved Israel. Did you get that? Even though the United Nuts and the Arabians and Ishmaelites and Iraq and Iran and uh, PLO and everybody else hates Israel. God loves them. To establish them forever. Did you get that? Israel will be a nation forever. America will end. It's not God bless America, my friend. I'm sorry. It's God bless Israel. We just saw that in verse 5. There's only one nation above all nations of all the worlds. The only Babylonian you can find today is the Roman Catholic Church by following their religious practices. You can't find a Babylonian today. They're gone. You can't find an old Greek that spoke the Greek of the, of the, of the uh, New Testament. They're gone. The Greeks today are not the Greeks. Only one nation has rise above all nations. Only one nation has people try to kill and, and destroy completely, and they're still there. Israel. God bless Israel. Paul says, pray for the peace in Jerusalem. Therefore made he the king over them, over the Jews, to do judgment and justice. And God will, and Jesus Christ will, do properly. When you go to the, to the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment, you will be judged with judgment, with justice, by a right judge, and you can't buy him off. And it will be honest judgment. And he'll bring it all out for you. And she gave the king... 120 talents of gold. Gold is one of the things that we get at the judgment seat of Christ. And of spices, a great abundance. Oh, some of those spices were used for the incense altar. That's the prayer of the saints. John the Baptist's father. When he went in there to offer incense, that was the time when they were outside praying. Isn't it great how you how the Bible just it's just so much, it's not a dead book. It's a wonderful book. It's a book yet to happen. It's a book of prophecy. Listen, no Pope can tell when he's gonna die. Uh, Buddha and all them couldn't tell when they were gonna die. Jesus knew the date 
and the hour he was going to die. And by the way, he didn't die. He gave his life. You can't kill God. And precious stones. That's another one of the things we get at the judgment seat of Christ. So I believe, like those elders, we take our crowns and we throw them back at Jesus. The one who gets them all. Who deserves them all. For it wasn't for him we'd be all burning in hell for eternity. I think his brother Sam Gitt, I like when he went in one of his messages. He said he believes we're all in heaven and this is, you know, a little joke, but it's funny. Oh, when we get to heaven, it's going to be like a bowling thing. You know, we throw our crowns back, and they come rolling back to us. So we can keep on doing it for all eternity. I like that message he preached about. Neither was there any such spice as the Queen of Sheba gave King Solomon. You say, what can you do with that one? What did God tell Moses about the incense and all that? And the anointing oil? Don't make no composition like it. You know, our prayers to God is sweet. It smells great. And he enjoys it. The servants also of Hiram. All right, now we've, now we've left the Queen of Sheba. And the servants of Solomon, which brought gold from Ophir, brought algum trees and precious stones. And the king made of the album trees terraces to the house of the Lord, and to the king's palace, and harps, and psalteries for singers. And there were none such seen before in the land of Judah. What's that? You know what Solomon did, that little bad boy that he was? Oh, man, I tell you. He took these almond trees and he cut them all down and there's no more. Oh! And God did not reprove him for it either. King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba. We're back to the Queen of Sheba. What happened? Well, we talked about some other people who had works and done things for the king. And now we're going back to the Queen of Sheba again. All her desire. What's every man want? Oh, I want a million dollars. No. You don't really want a million dollars. I know what you want. You want comfort. You want to live for, for all. You don't want to die. You don't want to have any bills. You don't want pain and suffering. And guess what God gives us if we obey his son? By the way, we're in, the, we're in New Jerusalem. The streets are gold. We walk on what man values today as the most important. Whatsoever she asked, besides that which, wait a minute, it doesn't say something in Philippians about something about God should provide all our need, something like that. You do see our relationship here. Besides that which she had brought unto the king. Notice how again, what you brought to the king. Listen, we're saved not by works. We are saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But since you've been saved, what have you done? What have you brought to the king? There are some people out there, they think just by them showing up, they, 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 they pleased all heaven. And there are some people that don't bring absolutely nothing. They don't even bring themselves. So she turned and went away to her own land, she and her servants. Well, that, we don't go back to our own land. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, we do. We come back with Jesus Christ, and some of us are going to give an opportunity to reign with him on this earth. Hey! Hallelujah! Old Testament, dull, stupid book, second card. Oh, 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 o
We do come back. We've come back with the king. The king's coming back, and boy, is he angry. She and her servants, that's all of us coming back. All the servants. What happens to those who don't do anything for Jesus Christ? That's a good question. What does happen to them? The Bible says, if you suffer with them, you shall reign with them. If you deny him, he'll deny you to reign, not your salvation. Now, oh boy, here we go. Solomon now turns the table. We are in trouble now. Solomon now becomes a type of the Antichrist. Whoa! I think I just heard 911. Baptist over the world just fell down on the ground and had a heart attack. He just said, what? You do know that the Antichrist and Jesus are so much alike that you can't tell them. Matter of fact, there are some idiots out there that say that horse rider in Revelation 5 is the same horse rider later on in uh, Revelation 20. I mean, 19, excuse me. They say those two horse riders are the same, and they're not. But they both got white horses. Both of them has a reference to a lion. The weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred and three score and six talents of gold. Six, six, six. Wow. Beside that which Chapman and the merchants brought. And all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the country brought gold and silver to Solomon. You do know the Arabians and Arabia and all that. You know they're going to be sides with the Antichrist because they got all the petroleum. When that Antichrist comes up with the one world government, you know those are the people first thing to be receiving a mark to sell their oil. You know, they go over there and they build million dollar uh, ice rinks and million dollar uh, everything. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. That's important. Because later on, they're going to be taken and they're going to exchange it for a lower class. But beaten targets of gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went into one target. So 600 into 200 will be 12,000. And 300 shields made he of beaten gold. 300 shekels of gold went into one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory. You mean he killed elephants? <laughs> he killed an elephant to make an ivory to make a throne. <laughs> Boy, he made Peter upset. So would I. I go to every Peter meeting with a one steak sauce. Personally, eating tasty animals is what I say. Again, personally eating tasty animals, Peter. I'm looking where I am. I'm, well, verse 17. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory. That wasn't bad enough. Look at this. And overlaid it with pure gold. And there were six steps. Six steps to the throne. That's the number of man, six. With a footstool of gold, which were fastened to the throne and stays on each side of the city place, and two lions standing by the stage. And twelve lions stood there on the one side, and on the other upon the, the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. So he's got this throne, it's up on six steps, and on each step there's two lions. So you ever seen a house? Or at the front, of, at the end of the driveway, or at the end of the walkway, they got lions there. You ever wonder where that came from? Go ask. Go knock on the door. Say, "How you doing?" I'm, 
You know why you get those lines? King James 611 Bible. Solomon had that. They put some people might not even know that. I just told you that. Through the Bible. And all the drinking vessels of King Solomon were gold. There was no silverware. It was goldware. And all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. And it was not anything counted of in the days of Solomon. Listen, you couldn't count the silver. You couldn't count the gold. There was no alloys put into this gold. It was pure gold. Listen, even Joseph had a silver cup. Solomon had a gold cup. For the king's ships went to Tarshish. Is that where Jonah went? Tarshish? I'm not sure. I think. With the servants of Hiram. Every three years, once came the ships of Tarshish, bringing gold, more gold. You ever ask you, where did that gold go? Babylon took it. Ezra and Nehemiah brought some back. And silver, ivory, more, more elephants, and apes, and peacocks. I don't understand the apes and peacocks. I've got to wonder if he just let him loose in his, uh, did he have a zoo? But it says every three years they brought apes and peacocks with ivory and silver and all that. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon. You know who all the kings of the world go to today? I'll give you one answer. Mr. Pope on the road. All the world goes to the Roman Catholic Church. All the world is going to the Muslims today. Very few leaders, very few nations, and some of them are in Africa, are based upon Jesus Christ and God the Father. Very few. <coughs> To hear his wisdom with, that God had put in his heart. Not education. That God put in his heart. Not a Bible school. Not a seminary. But God. And they brought every man his present. Vessels of silver. Vessels of gold. And raiment. Harness and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. And that rate year by year means they bought a set amount every year to Solomon. Do you see what's going on in Jerusalem at this time? Jerusalem is becoming the ultimate Walmart of the world. It has everything. Let me ask you a question. If you read the Bible, who has everything in the tribulation? The woman on the seven hills. Read that list. By the way, that list also mentions the souls of men as one of the merchandise. Now, like I said, Solomon switched over to the type of Antichrist. Now everything's coming to him. The Antichrist is going to get all commerce. There's only one way you're going to be able to buy things in the tribulation. you got to buy it through the Antichrist or you ain't going to get it. And there's going to be no counterfeit mark and no faking on that. Because the Bible says, and the Bible says, and the Bible says, unless you receive the mark, you can't do no trading. There's no fool in the Antichrist like these stupid movies. Those movies are against the Bible and what the Bible says. I've watched them. So Solomon's a type of Antichrist and everything's coming to him. All merchandise. And Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses 
and chariots. He's in love with those horses and chariots. And if you can say the second love of Solomon, I don't know. Really, there's two loves of Solomon. I don't know where to put number one and number two. There's the women and there's horses. I don't even know if you can put which one or two. He didn't build individual houses for his wives except for one. And 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the chariot cities. They're chariot cities. He didn't have wife cities. At least we're not told. But there were specific chariot cities for, for these people. And with the king of Jerusalem. And he reigned over all the kings from the river even unto the land of Philistines. And to the border of Egypt. He went all the way down the Sinai Pen Peninsula all the way to Egypt. You don't ever see a reign like that after Solomon. David's reign went all the way to the Euphrates. And the king made silver and Jerusalem as stones. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Hey, wouldn't you just picture, you know, you, you got to go grocery shopping, and you, and you're a little short, you go outside in the parking lot, pick up a stone and silver, and, you know, use it to buy your groceries. And cedar trees made he as sycamore trees. Sycamore trees are a common tree. But they were plentiful like the cedars that are in the low plains in abundance. Cedar trees were not, were, are not normally a lot. But in Solomon's time, see, he used all the algamon trees, but he grew cedar trees and took care of cedar trees. So Solomon did do tree planting. I forget what that kind of word is for, for when they go cut down trees and they put a replant in there. But Solomon did do that. He replanted trees. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And out of all lands. Now the acts, now the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last. Are they not written in the book of Nathan, the prophet? Yes, they are, but we don't have that book. And the prophecy... Uh, Ahijah, the Shulamite, and in the visions of Edo, the seer against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel 40 years. So, uh, Saul, David, and Solomon all reigned 40 years. 40 in your Bible is a number of testing. Moses and Jesus were up on a mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And Solomon slept with his fathers. And he was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. And we finish Solomon.